outermost world. So I had drawn the different worlds, right? Outermost world is the sepal or it is also called as the calyx. So when we go from bottom to top, the one that is close to the region of elongation is region of maturation because these elongated cells next tend to mature. What is this perianth? Perianth is nothing but wherein you can't distinguish between a petal and the sepal. Both will look one and the same. Hello everyone, a warm welcome to this session of revision class for first PUC Biology. I'm Dr. Divya, Biology faculty with Yashram Pre University College, Temple of Excellence, Mysore. So in this session, we'll learn about the morphology of flowering plants that is in the previous session of this chapter, we had dealt with the synopsis. So what and all comes under this particular chapter and also we learned some of the important three marks question that are likely to appear from this particular chapter. So in this session, we will learn only the multiple choice question. So from this chapter, one three mark question will be asked and two multiple choice questions will come from this particular chapter. So in this session, we'll concentrate only on the multiple choice questions. So what are adventitious roots? So adventitious roots, what are there? So we had learned the different types of roots, right? So fibrous root, tap root and the adventitious roots. So adventitious roots, are they the roots that, that arise from the radical? Are they the secondary roots? Roots that arise from parts of the plant other than the radical. So adventitious roots are nothing but roots that arise from parts of the plant other than the radical because we know that in the embryonal axis of the seed, on one end there is the plumule and on the other there is the radical. And from the plumule, the shoot arises and from the radical, the root arises. But these adventitious roots are the ones which do not arise from the radical but from other parts. Say for example from the branches, from the nodes of the stem as in sugarcane or from branches as in banyan tree. So they are called as the adventitious roots. Next question. What is the structure that covers the apex of the root? So apex means tip. So what is that structure? So is it region of meristematic activity? region of elongation, root cap, region of maturation. So roots contain three main regions. So in that one is region of meristematic activity wherein actively dividing cells are present. Above that is present the region of elongation and above the region of elongation is present the region of maturation. Now this region of meristematic activity that is there, the tip of this region is protected by something and that is nothing but root cap and it looks like a thimble which actually protects the young meristematic region of the root so that when it is growing deep into the soil nothing happens to those meristematic cells. So the structure that covers the apex of the root is nothing but the root cap. Next question, which region of the root is responsible for the growth of the root in terms of length? So in terms of length is it region of meristematic activity, region of elongation, root cap or region of maturation. It is the region of elongation because it is in this particular region, those cells which have actively divided, they tend to elongate so that the length of the root tends to increase. Next question, which region of the root is proximal to region of elongation? So proximal means close, <coughs> it is close to region of elongation. So is it region of meristematic activity, root cap, region of maturation, none of the above. So when I say proximal means of course the region of elongation lies between the region of the meristematic activity and the region of maturation. But here we have to go from bottom to top. So when we go from bottom to top, the one that is close to the region of elongation is region of maturation because these elongated cells next tend to mature and that region is the region of maturation. So option C is the right answer here. Next question. What are the delicate thread like structures called that absorb water and minerals from the soil? Epidermal cells, root hairs, meristematic cells, none of the above. 
So the delicate cells are called root hairs which arise from the region of maturation and they give extra support to the roots in terms of absorption of nutrients, minerals, or water, etc. Next question, which region of the root forms root hairs? Just now I told you it is the region of maturation. That is the last region where the root hairs usually arise. Next question, what are the regions of the stem called where leaves are born? Is it the nodes, buds, internodes or plumules? So it usually develops in the nodal region. So stem, that is in the stem, the leaves usually are born on the nodal region. So it is the nodes. So next question, what are internodes? The portion between two nodes, the region where leaves are born, the buds on the stem, the woody part of the stem. So what are nodes? First of all, let me see. So if this is a stem, they have nodes like this. So this is one node. This is the other one. It continues. So this portion between the two nodes, we call it as the internode. So what is internode? The portion between the two nodes. So therefore, option A is the right answer here. Next question. What is the source of a stem in a germinating seed? What is the source of a stem? There has to be some source from where the stem arises, right? So is it the cotyledons? Is it the radical? Is it the hypocotyl? Or is it the plumule? It is the plumule because the shoot or the stem arises from the plumule and the root arises from the radical. The cotyledons are nothing but these are the cotyledons which actually provide nourishment to the developing plumule and the shoot and the root. So therefore, the right answer here is Plumule. If the uh, question was what is the source of a root in the germinating seed, then the option that we should have selected was radical. But here for this particular question, plumule is the right answer. So next question, what is the purpose of stipules on a leaf? Now let me tell you what stipules are. So we have the stem and uh, I told you that it is from the nodal region that the leaf arises. So this is the petiole of the leaf. So this is the petiole and this is the base, leaf base from where the petiole arises. So here in the leaf base, there are small leaf like structures which are present and they are called as the stipules. They are called stipules. Now what is the purpose of a stipule on a leaf? It is to protect the young leaf. So to hold the blade to light, to provide rigidity to the leaf blade, to act as channels of transport for water, minerals and food material. So to hold the blade to light that this entire it is called as blade okay it is called leaf blade. So this entire thing we can call it as leaf blade. It's like this. So this entire thing it is nothing but leaf blade. Now this is the petiole and these are the venations. This is the midrib, midrib, these are the veins. Now here, to hold the leaf blade to light, it is petiole is responsible. Petiole is responsible. So questions on this also can be asked. So I am writing the answer for each of the, them. Next is to provide rigidity to the leaf blade. To provide rigidity, veins are there, midrib and veins are there. To act as channels of transport for water, there are also leaf veins or veinlets are there. To protect the leaf bud in its axil, it is the stipule. So, what is the purpose of stipules on a leaf? To protect the leaf bud in its axil. Option D is the right answer here. Next question. What is pulvinous? So, pulvinous is nothing but a leaf base. Okay. And it is a leaf base, but it is a swollen leaf base, usually in dicots, especially in bee plant and all. If you look, where the leaf arises, there will be a small swelling and then the leaf will come like this. So that is nothing but this small swelling that is present at the leaf base, it is called as pulvinus. In the case of dicots, usually dicots will exhibit this. So where do we find pulvinus? In dicotyledons. Monocots will not have this. It is usually seen in dicotyledons. Dicotyledons. And what is pulvinus? It is a swollen 
leaf base. So the right answer here is option A. Next question, what is the purpose of a petiole? To hold the blade to light. So to help to hold the leaf blade to light, for that also it is important. And to help the leaf blade flutter in the wind and cool the leaf, for that also petiole is important. So any one if you choose here also it is fine. Next, what is the purpose of veins in a leaf? To provide rigidity to the leaf blade. So it is the main thing is to provide rigidity. Because the leaf blade are very fragile, just like how in a fan, that is a hand fan, how there are a lot of sticks that they place so that when you use it, it doesn't tear fast. Supports are given. Same way here, the veins also act like support for the leaf blade. Next, what is the middle prominent vein in a leaf known as? It's known as midrib. So, in a leaf, if you look at a leaf, there are, this is, the first vein that is there, prominent one, which is called as the midrib. Then from the midrib, lot of veins will come. And from these veins, lot of veinlets will come. So the, which is the prominent one? It is the midrib. So the right answer here is midrib. Next one. Which type of plants have a leaf base that expands into a sheath covering the stem partially or wholly? Is it monocotyledons, dicotyledons, ferns, gymnosperms? Usually monocots. So if you look at the grasses and all that, say for example, this is the stem of a grass. You can see the leaf blade forming a sheath and then coming from the grass. Right? So that is called as sheath. Now this is called as a sheath. Banana also has a sheath. So here it is monocotyledon. Option A is the right answer. Next question. What is veination? Arrangement of stem and roots in a plant. Arrangement of veins and veinlets in a leaf. Arrangement of petals in a flower. Arrangement of fruits in a tree. So arrangement of veins and veinlets in a leaf is the right answer. Arrangement of petals in a flower we can call it as aestivation. Or sepals also, it is estivation. So option B is the right answer for this question. Next question. When the veinlets form a network, what type of veination is it called? When it forms a network, we call it as reticulate veination. In biology, whenever the word network comes, it means reticulate. Okay, keep that in mind. Say for example, a network of arrangement of uh, the endoplasmic, in endoplasmic reticulum, why it is called reticulum because there also there is a network of arrangement, right? So that, that is why. So it is uh, reticulate and usually reticulate venation is seen in dicotyledons. Parallel venation is seen in monocotyledons. That is one of the most important identification methods for a dicot and a monocot leaf. So here the right option for uh, question number 17 is reticulate venation. Next one. In which type of plants reticulate venation is generally found? It's in dicotyledons because in monocotyledons we have parallel venation is found. Next question. Which type of venation is the characteristic of most monocotyledons? Reticulate, parallel, spiral, curve. It is parallel. Next question. What is a simple leaf? A leaf with many incisions. So a leaf with many incisions, you call it as a compound leaf. A leaf with no lamina, no that's not possible. A leaf with an entire lamina or incisions that do not touch the midrib, a leaf with no petiole. So the right answer here is a leaf with an entire lamina. This is called with an entire lamina, you call it as simple leaf. And those leaves with their lamina touching, breaking at a point and touching the midrib, you call it as compound leaf. So that is the difference between a simple and a compound leaf. So for this question, option C is the right answer. Next one. What is a compound leaf? A leaf with a simple lamina. No, we call it as a simple leaf. A leaf with a midrib that is not present. No, this is wrong. A leaf with a petiole that is not present. No. A leaf with incisions that reach up to the midrib, breaking it into leaflets. So I have showed it to you in the previous question. So for this, option D is the right answer. Next question. 
in which compound leaf type are the leaflets attached to a common point at the tip of a petiole. Now here in a compound leaf we have something called as a palmately compound. So what happens here is this is the petiole and all the leaflets they join at a tip. It looks like a palm. So that is why it is called palmately compound leaf. Now pinnately compound leaf means it will look like this. They will not touch at a point to look like this. This is pinnately compound leaf like drumstick, neem all that is pinnately compound. Simple leaf means it will have an entire lamina uh, where no breakings in the in between the midribs. So here uh, the uh, answer is palmately compound leaf. Next question, what is an example of a plant with a pinnately compound leaf? Neem, silk cotton, rose, sunflower. It is neem. Neem is the best example for a plant with a pinnately compound leaf. So silk cotton is an example for palmately compound leaf. An example for palmately compound leaf. Sunflower, it is a simple leaf. Rose also simple leaf. So next question. What is an example of a plant with a palmately compound leaf? It is silk cotton. Neem, as I told you, it is pinnately compound. Next, what is phyllotaxy? Now here, phyllo, phylla means leaf. Understand this, meaning is leaf. So in biology, you know, usually if you know the meanings, it is very easy to answer questions. So now, taxa means arrangement, right? Or classification or arrangement. So what is phyllotaxy? A type of soil, a pattern of arrangement of leaf is called as phyllotaxy. Because leaf arrangement is called as phyllotaxy. So therefore option B is the right answer here. Next question. Which of the following is an example of the alternate type of phyllotaxy? So alternate. So alternate means we'll have the stem. So this is the stem and the leaves are arranged alternate like this. So which of the following is an example for the alternate type of phyllotaxy? It is mustard. So option C, mustard is the right answer. So in Alstonia, usually we have world phyllotaxy. So Alstonia is for world phyllotaxy. Then in Guava, usually we have opposite phyllotaxy, opposite so these are some of the examples. So therefore here mustard is the right answer. Next one, which plant exhibits world phyllotaxy? Is it China rose, mustard, sunflower, alstonia? It is alstonia because mustard as I told you it has alternate phyllotaxy, alternate. China rose also has alternate phyllotaxy. So therefore right answer here is Alstonia. So these are the uh, examples taken from the ones that are there in the NCRT textbook itself. Next question, which of the following plants exhibits opposite phyllotaxy? So uh, mustard and calotropes, we can say they are alternate phyllotaxy. Alstonia is a world phyllotaxy. So therefore guava is the one that shows opposite phyllotaxy. So therefore guava is the right answer here. Next question. What is the pattern of phyllotaxy in sunflower? In sunflower, it is alternate phyllotaxy. So opposite, we find it in guava is one example. Calotropis is one example. World alstonia is an example. Alternate china rose is an example. So sunflower also exhibits alternate phyllotax. So alternate mustard is also an example because these examples can also be given for the MCQs. I'm writing it down. And all of these are the ones that are there in the NCRT textbook. So what is the pattern of phyllotax in sunflower? It is alternate. Instead of sunflower, here they can write it as china rose and mustard can also come. So that is why I've written it there. Next question, what is the arrangement of flowers on the floral axis called? So arrangement of flowers, is it called inflorescence, internodes, appendages, meristem? It's called inflorescence. Inflorescence is the arrangement of flowers in a floral axis in that there are two types, cymose and racemose. So we have learned that in the synopsis. 
Next question, in which type of inflorescence does the main axis continues to grow? So it is in racemose inflorescence wherein the main axis will continues to grow and oppositely flowers keep on forming like this. So it is wherein they have a arrangement wherein the younger flowers are at the top and the older ones are at the bottom and therefore it is an acropetal arrangement. What is the arrangement called? Acropetal meaning younger ones are at the top and the older ones are at the bottom. So in which type of inflorescence does the main axis continues to grow? It is racemose. Cymose will have limited growth. Unlimited growth is in racemose. Next question, in which type of inflorescence do the flowers have a basipetal order? So acropetal I told you it is in racemose. So basipetal it is in cymose. So what does basipetal means? The older flowers will be at the top, younger will be at the bottom. So there are two types here, arrangement, acropetal and basipetal. Acropetal means young at bottom and older at the top. Basipetal means young will be at the top and older at the bottom. It's like that. So therefore, basipetal order is seen in. So you have to see where actually the older flowers are situated or the younger ones are situated. So if younger ones are at the bottom, we call it as acropetal arrangement. And if the younger ones are at the top, we call it as the basipetal arrangement. So it is cymose inflorescent. So next question, what are the four different kinds of whorls in a typical flower? So flower is usually made up of five whorls. So what are there? It is calyx, corolla, andrichum, gynecium or it is made up of four whorls. What are there? Calyx, corolla, andrichum, gynecium, root stem, leaf bark. So root stem, leaf bark has nothing to do with the flower. Petal, stamen, sepal, ovary. Yeah, that also but we need to use this word. So the right answer here is calyx, corolla, andrichum and gynecium. So wherein the outer whorl it's called as calyx. Then inner to the calyx, there is the corolla. Inner to corolla, there is the andrisium. And inner to the andrisium is the gynecium. This is how it is arranged. So therefore, calyx, corolla, andrisium and gynecium. Calyx is nothing but sepal. Corolla is nothing but petal. Next question, what is a unisexual flower? The name itself says uni, meaning one. In one plant, only one sexual flower will be present, either the male or the female. So a flower with both stamens and carpels, a flower with either stamens or carpels, a flower with no stamens or carpels, a flower with four whorls. No, it is a flower with either stamens or carpel. Because if both stamens and carpels are present in the same flower, we call it as bisexual. So here the right answer here is a flower with either stamens or carpal. So stamens are the male reproductive organ, carpal is the female reproductive organ. Next question, what is an actinomorphic flower? So actinomorphic, zygomorphic is nothing but the symmetry of the flower. So actinomorphic, a flower with bilateral symmetry, a flower with radial symmetry, a flower with no symmetry, a flower with asymmetrical petals. It is a flower with radial symmetry. We call it as actinomorphic and it is represented like this. Next question, what is a zygomorphic flower? A flower with radial symmetry, a flower with bilateral symmetry, a flower with no symmetry, a flower with asymmetrical petals. It is a flower with bilateral symmetry and it is usually represented like this. That is from the center, if you draw a line, one half is the exact mirror image of the other. And for actinomorphic, usually almost all the flowers are actinomorphic. For zygomorphic, usually monocotyledonous flowers are zygomorphic in nature. Next question, which flower cannot be divided into two similar halves by any vertical plane passing through the center? Is it actinomorphic? Bracteate, zygomorphic, asymmetry. Asymmetry means it doesn't have a symmetry. Anywhere you draw a line, one half will not match the other. It is called as asymmetrical flower. Option D. Next question, what is a bracteate flower? 
a flower with bracts reduced leaf found at the base of the pedicel a flower without bract a flower without bract is called as ebractate a flower with colorful petals a flower with symmetrical petals it is a flower with bracts that was present at the base of the leaf we call it as or at the base of the pedicel of the leaf we call it as bractate next one what is an ebractate flower a flower without bracts we call it as ebractate flower next question what is a pentamerous flower a flower with floral appendages in multiple of 3 4 5 penta means 5 penta means 5 uh, tetra means 4 tri means 2 so therefore here a flower with floral appendages in multiple of 5 that is corolla will be arranged in five whorls stamens in five carpels in like that so if the flowers have the, they are that is pentamerous means the floral appendages are in multiple of 5 so it is called pentamerous flower next question in which type of flower is the gynoecium situated in the center and other parts of the flower located on the rim of the thalamus almost at the same level so gynoecium is located at the center is it called hypogynous perigynous epigynous none of the above it's called perigynous so hypogynous means it is the gynoecium is located at the base epigynous that is gynoecium is located at the top epigynous means gynoecium is located at the base next question which type of flower has the ovary completely enclosed and fused with the margin of the thalamus and the other parts of the flower arise about it so uh, other parts of the flower arise above it means obviously the ovary or the gynoecium will be at the base and it is a inferior ovary so inferior ovary means it is epigynous next question superior ovary means it is hypogynous or if the question is asked which type of flower has the ovary that is present on top of the thalamus and all the other parts of the flower arise below it we call when it arises from the below the ovary will be at the top so it is called as hypogynous for this particular question epigynous is the right answer next question what is the position of the ovary in hypogynous flower it is high low is an epigynous middle it is perigynous next which flowers have inferior ovary it is epigynous they have inferior ovary next question so this is the same thing i have just made the questions in different ways so that this is how they can twist and ask in the exam so that is why i have put it in different ways next question what is the position of the gynoecium in a hypogynous flower hypo means position of gynoecium will be high next which flowers have half inferior ovary half means it will be somewhere in the middle it is perigynous next question so what kind of flower is china rose it is hypogynous even mustard is also hypogynous and also brinjal for perigynous we have plum rose peach all that is perigynous for epigynous there is cucumber then ray florets of sunflower that is for epigynous so these are different examples i have given because for this also questions can be framed so what kind of flower is the china rose china rose is a hypogynous or instead of china rose they can put mustard and brinjal also because both of these also exhibit hypogynous flower that is ovary superior next question what type of flower has the other parts of the flower situated below the gynoecium so it is again here below the gynoecium means it is hypogynous so if other parts of the flower come from below the gynoecium then the gynoecium will be superior so therefore it is hypogynous next which flower has the highest position for the gynoecium it is hypogynous so this is the same thing i have just made it in different question formats and i put it here next what is the outermost whorl of the flower called outermost whorl so i had drawn the different whorls right outermost whorl is the sepals or it is also called as the calyx next what is the function of sepals in a flower 
to attract pollinators to protect the flower and bud stage. So to attract pollinators, it is the function of the petals to produce nectar. Nectar is usually produced in the receptacle region or the thalamus somewhere there. To hold the stamens and pistils in place, that is again the thalamus or the receptacle. So the function of the sepals in the flower is to protect the flower in a bud stage. Next question, what is aestivation? So the arrangement of sepals of flowers in the floral bud or the flower bud, we call it as the aestivation. So the process of pollination, no. The opening and closing of the flower, no. The production of nectar, no. It's option A. 53, the next question. What is the aestivation in pea and bean flowers? So pea and bean flowers, they usually come under leguminous, legumes, leguminous plants. And I told you they are the flowers which exhibit zygomorphic symmetry, wherein one you draw a line at the center, one half is exactly similar to the other. And their aestivation looks like a butterfly. So therefore it is or it looks like the lips. So it, therefore, it is vexillary aestivation. Instead of vexillary, they can also give the option as papillonaceous aestivation because papillonaceous, papillon means butterfly. So, papillonaceous also, if they give, that is also the right answer here. For now, here I have put it as vexillary. So, we have to write vexillary aestivation. So, what is the aestivation in calotropis? It is valvate aestivation. So, twisted, we have China rose, lady's finger, comma, cotton. So all these are for twisted aestivation. For imbricate, so for imbricate aestivation, we have cassia and gulmohar. For vexillary, there is pea, bean, all the legumes, they exhibit vexillary aestivation. So therefore, these examples I have written because based on this also questions can be asked. For this question, what is the aestivation in calotropies? It is valvate aestivation. Next, what does a stamen represent? Male reproductive organ, female reproductive organ, both male and female reproductive, none of the above. It is male reproductive organ. Female reproductive organ is nothing but carpal. Next, what is a sterile stamen? This is one of the important MCQ. What is a sterile stamen? Anther, staminode, filament, pollen sac. So sterile stamens are usually called as staminode. So it is staminode. And this is quite important. Next, when stamens are attached to the petals, they are called. This is also very important. This question also. What is it called? Is it called epiphyllus, polyandrous, epipetalus? So it is called epipetalus. Epipetalus means they are attached to the petals. Usually seen in which members? Solanaceae members. Solanaceae or potato family, they exhibit epipetalous form of stamens. So next, in which flower are stamens united in one bunch or bundle? Is it pea, salvia, china rose, citrus? It is in china rose, they are seen in one bundle means it is mona adelphus. In pea, it is two bundles, dia delphus. Diadelphus and in citrus it is polyadelphus. In salvia vary in length. The length of the filament of the stamen they tend to vary. So here in which flower are stamens united in one bunch or bundle or in which flowers are the stamens mona adelphus? Like that also question can be asked. So if that is a question then also, the answer is China rose itself. In P, it is diadelphus. In citrus, it is polyadelphus. So, citrus exhibit polyadelphus. Salvia, they usually show variations in the length of the filament of the stamen. So, next question. What is the variation seen in stamens in salvia and mustard? Size of stamen, length of filaments. It is length of filament, I told you previously. So, option B is the right answer. Next, what are stamens attached to the perianth called? If it is attached to the perianth, we call it as epiphyllus. So it is called epiphyllus. If it is epipetalus, means attached to petals. If it is attached to perianth, it is called as epiphyllus. And what is this perianth? Perianth is nothing but wherein you can't distinguish between a petal and the sepal. Both will look one and the same. 
Next question. How many chambers does each lobe in an anther have? One, two, three, four. So each lobe in an anther has two chambers. Totally four, but each lobe will have two chambers. Next, what is, or if the question is, how many chambers are there in an anther, then you write four. But what is my question here? How many chambers does each lobe in an anther have? So it is two chambers. Next, what is placentation? Formation of fruit after fertilization, the arrangement of ovules within the ovary, the fusion of carpels in a flower, the formation of stigma in a flower. The arrangement of ovules inside the ovary, you call it as placentation. Next question. What is a parthenocarpic fruit? So parthenocarpic fruit is nothing but those fruits which develop without fertilization. That is uh, seedless fruits that we call. So fruit formed with fertilization of the ovary, a fruit formed without fertilization of the ovary. Option B is the right answer here. Next question. What is the outermost covering of a seed? Endosperm, embryo, seed coat, cotyledon. It is the seed coat. Within the seed coat, we have the cotyledons. In the cotyledon, we have the endosperm. And in the endosperm, there is the embryo that is present. Okay, next question. What are the two layers of the seed coat? Testa and hilum, tegmen and plumule, testa and tegmen, micropyle and cotyledon. It is testa and tegmen, wherein testa forms the outer covering, tegmen forms the inner covering. This also question can be asked. Next, what is the scar on the seed coat called? It is called hilum. So usually seeds, they'll have a small scar here and that scar is nothing but called as hilum. That scar is developed due to the placenta, like how we have the belly button, right? In our navel region, the belly button that is there, it is nothing but the scar that is left by the placenta. Same way in seeds, the scar that is left by the placenta is called as a hilum. Next question. What is a small pore above the hilum called? It's called micropyle. Pile means pore, micro means small. Next, what is the function of endosperm in monocotyledon seed? Stores food, protects the embryo, provides nutrient to the seed coat, none of the above. It is stores food. Next, which of the following is an example of non-endospermic seeds? Is it cereals such as maize, legumes? Is it orchids? Or is it none of the above? It is usually legumes, that is pea, bean and all that. Leguminous plants, they do not have endosperm. So they are non-endospermic seeds. Next, what is the outer covering of endosperm called? Cotyledon, scutellum, alluron, layer, plumule. It is alluron layer and this layer is very rich in protein. This is also one of the very important questions. Next question. What is the name of the structure that encloses the plumule in monocotyledon seed called? So, coleoptile, scutellum, coleoriza, alluron layer. It is coleoptile. So, coleoptile is the one that actually encloses the plumule. Which of the following? Coleoriza encloses the root or you can say encloses the radical. Actually, radical is right. Radical. Next. Which of the following is fused with the seed coat in cereals such as maize? Alluron layer, fruit wall, plumule, radical. So it is alluron layer that is fused with the seed coat in cereals such as maize and that alluron layer is rich in proteins. Next, what is the function of coleoriza in monocotyledon a seed? So coleoriza has something to do with the radical. Protect the plumule, stores food. Aids in seed dispersal, none of the above. It is none of the above because protects the plumule is done by coleoptile. So that is why. Next, what is the function of alluron layer in monocotyledon seed? Stores food, protects the embryo, separates the embryo from endosperm, none of the above. So it actually separates the embryo from the endosperm. That is one of the main function of the alluron layer. Stores food and all that is done by the endosperm. So that is why separate the embryo from endosperm is alluron layer. Next question, what does the symbol represent in the floral formula? So this question, I've just put it as the symbol. So any symbol can be asked. Say for example, if they ask this symbol, then you have to write it is zygomorphic. Now if this is a symbol, it is actinomorphic. So this is for zygomorphic. And this one is for actinomorphic. Remember this. So I have not put any symbol there. So if it is this symbol, then you have to write zygomorphic. If it is this symbol that is put, then you have to write 
actinomorphic. So this was about the session wherein we learnt about the different MCQ questions that can be framed from this particular chapter. So I hope you found this revision class useful. So we shall meet again in the coming session discussing a new chapter and the important questions under it. So see you in the next session. Thank you.